So this is an undergraduate mathematics talk on the ABC conjecture. Um, if anybody has come here wanting to know whether or not Mochizuki has proved the ABC conjecture, um, the answer is I don't know and I'm not qualified to say. What this talk is going to be about, I'm going to say what the ABC conjecture is, and then I'll give the proof of it for polynomials, and then I'll make a few comments on the current state of it. So first of all, what the ABC conjecture is, it says if you have integers A, B, and C with A plus B equals C, and here A, B, and C should be co-prime, then C is at most the radical of A, B, C with a small fudge factor here. So what is the radical? Well, the radical, the radical of an integer N is the product of the distinct prime factors. For instance, the radical of um, 200 is 10 because 200 is prime factors two and five. And epsilon is some rather small positive number and this holds for all but a finite number of integers a, b, c, where this finite number depends on what this number epsilon is. So let me give a few examples to explain this. Um, so, so we have a plus b plus equals c, and we want c is less than or equal to the radical of a, b, c to the one plus epsilon. Well, why do we need this number epsilon here? Well, we can have things like 1 plus 8 equals 9. And here the radical of A, B, C, so this is A, this is B, this is C. The radical of A, B, C is the radical of 72, which is 6. And C is definitely bigger than 6. So, so if we didn't put this number epsilon in here, the A, B, C conjecture would just be false. You can actually find quite a lot of examples like this. Um, so the question is, how big can epsilon be? And people have tried to find examples where epsilon is as large as possible. And one of the biggest, for example, is, was found by Ray Sat and says that 2 plus 3 to the 10 times 109 equals 23 to the 5. And the radical of ABC is 2 times 3 times 109 times 23 which is 15042, and this number C is 23 to the 5, which is 6436343. So it's quite a bit bigger than, the rad than this radical, but it's, it's less than the square of the radical. So epsilon e is less than 1 even in this example. So why are people interested in the ABC conjecture? Well, it implies a whole string of other very deep conjectures in number theory. I'm not going to list them all. I'll just, just talk about one of them. So Fermat's last theorem says that x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n has no non-trivial solutions for n greater than or equal to 3, apart from one of these being 0 or something like that. Um, well, if you write a is x to the n and y is b to the n, and z is c to the n, then the ABC conjecture would say that c is less than or equal to the radical of ABC um, to the 1 plus epsilon. Now, the radical of ABC is going to be at most um, x, y, z. Here we're taking x, y, and z to be co-prime to the 1 plus epsilon. So c is bigger than x and y, so we find that um, z to the n would be less than or equal to z cubed to the 1 plus epsilon. And obviously, if n is bigger than, if n is sufficiently large and epsilon is sufficiently small, then there are only going to be a finite number of solutions to this. And if you had a precise version of the ABC conjecture, this would allow you to give a proof of Fermat's last theorem. Of course, the problem with this is that Fermat's last theorem was proved by Andrew Wiles by a different and very difficult method um, in the many years ago. But 
Um, this just gives an example of how the ABC conjecture can be used to prove various other theorems. So what I'm going to do now is to show you how to prove the ABC conjecture in a slightly different version. This is the ABC for polynomials. And this was proved by um, Stothers and Mason uh, around about 1980 or 81 or something. And what it says is that if a, B, C are polynomials. Um, to be, let, let's make them co have complex coefficients. No, this isn't really necessary. Um, and suppose that A plus B equals C and A, B, C are co-prime. Then the degree of C is less than the degree of the radical of A, B, C. Um, here we assume that A, B, C are not constants. Um, so what's the radical of A, B, C? Well, it's the product of the distinct linear factors. Uh, since we're working over the complex numbers. If you're not working over the complex numbers, the statement has to be modified very slightly. Um, so the degree of the radical in this case is um, the number of distinct zeros of A, B, and C. Um, and it has an amazingly short proof which I think was due to Noah Snyder in about the year 2000, which uh, possibly fits onto one piece of paper and uses nothing more than basic calculus. You, if you need to know what the derivative of a polynomial and the derivative of a quotient is, and if you know enough, that, that, that's enough to follow this proof. So suppose if A plus B equals, equals C, then we know that a over b plus 1 is equal to c over b. Now we differentiate both sides and we find that a prime b minus b prime a is equal to c prime b minus b prime c. Here I've just differentiated both sides and then taken out a factor of b squared. Let's make f equal to this. And now you notice that f is not equal to 0 because if f was 0, then b would divide b prime times a, but b and a are co-prime by definition. So we're saying a, b, and c are pairwise co-prime. And we're working characteristic zero, so b can't divide its derivative. If you want to do this over fields of characteristic p, you need to be a little bit more careful, but we, we won't worry about that. And now we also notice that well, let, let, let's write a and a prime for the greatest common divisor of a and its derivative. And we notice that these all divide f and a co-prime. So a, a prime divides f because any common divisor of a and a prime divides both that factor and that factor and so divides f and similarly these all divide f. Since they're co-prime we see the degree of a a prime plus the degree of b b prime plus the degree of c c prime is less than the degree of f which is the degree of a plus the degree of b minus one. And now we notice the degree of A and A prime is just the degree of A minus the number of distinct zeros of A. And this follows because if we write A is equal to T minus alpha to the N1, T minus beta to the N2 and so on, then A prime 
um, then the highest common factor of a and a prime is going to be t minus alpha to the n1 minus 1, t minus beta to the n2 minus 1, and so on. So um, similarly, the degree of the highest common factor of b and b prime is the degree of b minus the number of distinct zeros, and same for c. So the degree of a plus the degree of b plus the degree of c minus the number of distinct zeros of a, b, and c is less than to the degree of a plus the degree of b minus 1. And now we notice that we've got this factor degree of a on the left and the right and this factor degree of b on the left on the right. And so we find the degree of c is less than the number of distinct zeros of a and b and c, which is what we wanted to prove. Um, so we can give an application of that. We can prove Fermat's last theorem for polynomials. So suppose x, y, and z are polynomials in some variable t, by I mean complex polynomials. And suppose they're co-prime, and suppose that x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n with n greater than or equal to 3. So this is like Fermat's last theorem, except that instead of x, y, and z being integers, we're taking them to be polynomials. And now we let a be this, and b be this, and c be this. Um, and then we find that the degree of C is less than the number of distinct zeros, which is at most the degree of X, Y, Z. Um, so N times the degree of Z is less than three times the degree of z. Here we're taking, we may assume that the degree of z is bigger, is at least equal to the degree of x and y by swapping them around if necessary. So this gives n less than three, which is what we wanted to prove. If n equals two, there are indeed solutions. For instance, we can take one minus t squared squared plus two t squared equals one plus t squared or squared. So we, we, we can't do better than this. By the way, if you're working over a field of characteristic p, then you can get formulas like 1 to the p plus t to the p equals 1 plus t to the p. So this is working mod p. So you need to be a little bit more careful if you're not working over the complex numbers. Um, so we've got a proof that works over polynomials. Um, what happens if you try and modify that proof to work over the integers? Well, no one's been able to think of a way of doing that. The trouble is this proof very much relies on the fact that you can differentiate polynomials. And the trouble is nobody knows a really good way to differentiate an integer. I mean, the derivative of an integer is just zero, which doesn't really help very much. Um, so... Um, I'll finish by just saying a little bit about the current state of the proof for the integers. So Mochizuki in 2012 um, put out several papers presenting a possible proof of the ABC conjecture. And the reaction of mathematicians, this was a bit odd. Um, the problem was the proof was incredibly difficult. It was several hundred pages long and relied on thousands of pages of um, previous work by Mochizuki that most mathematicians knew very little about. And it wasn't very easy to read. I mean, I think most mathematicians did roughly what I did, that spent a few hours trying to read it and then gave up and hoped somebody else would tell them what was going on. Um, if you've ever seen the, one of these wildlife moves of penguins, say emperor penguins, all want to jump into the sea, 
and go swimming, but none of them want to be first in because, you know, there might be a leopard seal there. So all the emperor penguins are trying to push each other into the sea because they don't want to be first in. And mathematicians were behaving a bit like that with Mochizuki's proof. Everybody wanted someone else to be the first to read it and tell them whether it was safe to read the proof or not. Um, anyway, several people have... Um, read Mochizuki's proof and some of them say it's correct and some of them say it isn't so we're kind of stuck um so in particular um Schultzer and Styx have put out um a preprint saying something they say is a problem and I'll try and describe roughly what the problem is I'm going to have to simplify rather grossly um so let me, uh, I'll explain what they say is the problem by a sort of analogy. Suppose you've got three countries and there's maybe a lake in the middle. So there are three borders and each of these currencies has currency, has some current, each of these countries has some currency. So this country uses dollars and at this border, you can exchange the currency and say one dollar is say two euros. And at this border, you can say maybe the exchange rate is one euro is three pounds. And at this border, if you say one dollar is six pounds, we've got that the right way around, two euros, which is three pounds, then there's no problem. Um, everybody is happy. But if you said one dollar is equal to five pounds, then there'd be rather interesting problems. People would be going round and round and round here, making lots of money, and things wouldn't be consistent. Um, and um, Mochizuki's proof has um, a lot of one-dimensional real vector spaces in it, and real vector spaces can be thought of as something like a unit of currency, an element of uh, an element of currency is. In, mathematicians terms an element of a one-dimensional real vector space and you need to identify all these one-dimensional vector spaces make them compatible and that means you have to choose it's like choosing an exchange rate between currencies and furthermore you need these exchange rates to be compatible that if you identify these two vector spaces and these two vector spaces and these two vector spaces you've got to make sure that all the three identifications are compatible so are these compatible? So Schultz and Stix isolated, well, there weren't three countries. There were more like six or seven countries in a big circle with, with lots of identifications. So Schultz and Stix examined Mochizuki's proof and found all these vector spaces and studied the compatibility condition and said they thought these relations were not compatible. And Mochizuki said, yes, they are compatible. Um, so why don't we just check and work out what these exchange rates are and check whether they're compatible. The trouble is Mochizuki's proof is so incredibly complicated that it's extremely difficult to figure out what these exchange rates are, are actually are and whether they're not, I mean, even if they're not compatible, the inconsistency might be so small that it doesn't matter. So it's really unclear whether or not that there is this problem with the proof. Um, with most deep mathematical theorems, it's possible to give a very fairly short summary of what the key idea in the proof is. For instance, Perelman proved the Poincaré conjecture a few years ago. And the proof of this is really hard. It takes several hundred pages of hard mathematics to write out but you can summarize the proof in a few lines. So, so what Perelman did is he applied something called the Ricci flow, where you take a three sphere and you deform it according to certain equations. And every now and then when you deform it, something goes wrong, so you have to cut a bad bit off. It's called doing surgery and then continue deforming the sphere. And you can sort of explain that in a few lines and mathematicians get a rough idea of what the proof is, even if they don't understand the details. So you can explain the key idea of the proof, even though the details take you know, hundreds of pages. 
Um, so what's the key idea in Mochizuki's proof? And as far as I can figure out, that doesn't no no one seems to know. No, no one has been able to explain, um, give some simple summary of what is going on. Um, so why don't you check it on a computer? Um, we now have computer checked proofs of really very long and difficult theorems. Um, like the fight Thompson theorem is several hundred pages long, and that has now been check checked by computer. So why can't you do that with Mochizuki's theorem? Well, the problem is that you can only check theorems on a computer if the proof is really, really, really well understood by humans. The, the current state of the art for computer checking, the computers are not very good at finding the proofs. They need to have the proof explained to them in extraordinary detail and as far as I know no one has managed to formalize the proof of Mochizuki's theorem yet so that a computer can understand it maybe in another 10 or 20 years um, computer proofs will reach that state so at the moment we're in this very unfortunate state and have been so for eight years where it's simply unclear whether or not this theorem is proved um, this is almost unprecedented. I don't know of any other cases when there's been this much controversy about whether a proof is correct or not. Anyway, I think that's enough about the ABC conjecture.